Good morning, Due West. My name is Matthew Bolaine, and I'm excited to be coming on board to be the next Director of Communications and Media. I look forward to joining the Due West staff soon and getting to know the congregation, but enough about me, here are a few things for you to know. There are still several summer camp opportunities for kids over here at the church. Our Makers Modern Craft Camp will be July 18th through the 22nd. Go to the sign-ups tab of Church Center to register, as we're also hosting some science camps. Two more opportunities are available for that from July 18th through the 22nd and the 25th through the 29th. Go to the Children's Ministry page of our website to find the link to register. Waymaker Women's Center is excited to celebrate their one-year anniversary of serving our community on July 16th. It has been tremendous to see the work that they have done to support women and families in college. Thank you so much for all you do to support this ministry, and we look forward to many more years of ministry. Be sure to make plans to attend our ladies' game night. All ladies are invited to join us on July 16th from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. in the gathering place in Building A. We will have game stations set up with plenty of fun games to play, as well as hors d'oeuvres and drinks provided. If you would like to attend, you can register on the sign-ups tab of Church Center. Finally, join us next week, July 17th at 12 p.m. for a celebration for Mandy Kirkpatrick. After 20 years of faithful service to Due West, she has accepted a position at Mount Perrin Christian School. Come and show your appreciation for her many years at a reception in her honor. Now, let us prepare our hearts for worship. Good morning, Due West. It is great to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Would you stand and sing with me our opening hymn, Love Divine, All Love's Excelling.
Now it's on. Good morning. Yeah, yeah. All right, uh, that's my, my fault. I apologize about that. Uh, let's continue to worship now that you're in such a worshipful mood, thanks to me. Uh, let's continue to worship by uniting this historic confession of the Christian faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please have a seat. At this time, we want to share both joys as well as concerns in the life of our church. Uh, I got up here, listened to the prelude, and realized I didn't have my Bible. It was sitting on my desk, so I had to run back and get it. Came in here, walked up to uh, start to talk, and realized my mic was not plugged in, so I had to do that and wake you guys up. Uh, so, so much for the concerns today. I, I don't know. Apparently, I am a concern today. Uh, But we do have joys. Uh, One of them is that today, right after this service, we have our annual uh, McGuire Scholarship Fund luncheon. We have 10 students this year uh, that will each receive a $1,000 scholarship from you all, from Due West. Yes. Uh, Great work of our United Methodist men, so we thank them for all they do to make this possible. Uh, They are sponsoring that lunch, so we will celebrate those students today. So that's certainly a joy. It's always a joy when we have people uh, out in the world being the hands and feet of Jesus. Mark and Ethan Hellman have been in Portugal this past week doing a sports camp. They are, you said, over the Atlantic right now, Jen said. So we pray for their safe return. So we're glad that they uh, have had a good trip. Uh, And then we've got a group going to Guatemala this week as well. So we're always excited about people. That's always a joy. We also have concerns in the life of our church. We want to remember Rich and Carol Denhart. Rich lost his dad this week, so please keep them in your prayers. Uh, Also, normally Robbie Edwards is in the sound booth every week running sound for us. Robbie lost his mom yesterday, Uh, so please keep Robbie and his family in your prayers. Uh, It's a tough time for their family. And we mentioned last week that Christine, uh, she lost her 18-year-old cousin in an automobile accident. She is in Connecticut this weekend for the funeral. So that's where Christine is. We thank Susan for filling in. So thank you for, for being here. Uh, but So please keep them all in your prayers. I know that you have concerns of your own that you want to take to the Lord in prayer this morning, and we want to give you that opportunity. So now we'll have a moment of silent prayer where you can take your concerns to the throne of God, and then I'll offer a prayer on behalf of the church. Let us pray. Love divine, all loves excel. Joy of heaven to earth come down. We gather together in your house and praise you that Jesus, the joy of heaven, to earth came down to be one of us, to be our healer, to be our rock, to be our Lord, to be our Savior. And so, Lord, for all you are, all the things you are to us, We gather together and join our hearts and our souls and our spirits and our voices in praise and adoration, in worship of the powerful name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for who you are, and we thank you for all you have done. Lord, we thank you for the work done for these scholarships. We thank you for the young lives that will be impacted by this. We thank you that as they go away to school, They go knowing they have the love and the prayers of their church family. We thank you, dear Lord, that they know uh, that the cost to school is made a little easier because they have a church family that loves them and cares for them and invests in them. Lord, for 
all of the ways that you are at work in your church and through your church. We give you thanks. Lord, let us always, always remember not to point to ourselves, but always point to you. For it is always you who are at work. Father, we thank you as well that we can come and bring the concerns of our hearts before you. Lord, we have concerns that reach around the world for our mission teams, for those in countries that are torn by war, for those people, dear Lord, wherever they are, that do not know you. Lord, for our concerns for our nation, for the divisions, the unrest, the uncertainty. Lord, we pray that you, as only you can, would bring healing to this nation. We pray, as always, for our leaders, that you would give them wisdom, discernment, to make decisions that are not necessarily easy, but that are best. Father, we pray for the community around us, for those who are, Lord, living in darkness. Be for them the light of the world. Lord, for those who have souls that are hungry, be for them the bread of life. Lord, for those that are grieving in our community and here in our congregation, be resurrection and be life. Fill them, Lord, with the promises of your word, with the hope and comfort that can only come from you. Father, we pray that you would continue to be with us as a church family, that you would use us as your hands, your feet, your voice. Lord, let all that we do serve to lift up the name of Jesus because your word tells us that when you are lifted up, all people are drawn to you. So, Father, as we continue this morning in a spirit and attitude of prayer, we ask you would hear all of our prayers, meet all of our needs, Forgive us all of our sins, for we pray in the powerful name of your Son and our Savior, Christ Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, as we prepare to receive our morning offering this morning, and as our ushers come down, we have some pictures for you. Uh, all summer long we have camps going on across campus. We've done science camp, science camp pottery camp, uh, dance camp, all kinds of camps, bringing children from our church and our community onto the campus uh, to enjoy a time of fellowship and to know that there's a place here uh, where they are loved and where they can experience the love of God. So we want to say thank you for all you do, for all your support, for all the ways you give, whether it's in the offering plates or whether it's online, because your gifts make it possible for us to be the church for our community. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for every gift. We thank you for every giver. And as we prepare this morning again to bring our gifts before you, Lord, we pray that you would receive them and use them for kingdom work. In Jesus' name, amen.
makes me out to more than I can be. You raise me up so I can stand on mountains. You raise me up to walk on stormy sea. I am strong and I am on your shoulders. Raise me up to more. Thank you. You may be seated. Again, Matt, outstanding. Thank you so much. Our scripture this morning comes from Galatians, the fifth chapter. We're going to start with the second verse and read through verse six. So if you have your Bibles with you, Galatians chapter five, starting with verse two, or as always, it will be on the screen. Paul writes to the church and says this, mark my words, I, Paul, tell you. But if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. But by faith, we eagerly await through the Spirit the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, open our hearts, open our souls this morning. Speak to us from your word. Help us, dear God, today and always to be the church you are calling us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you were here last week, uh, you heard me say that I actually had not planned on preaching in the month of July. I was not scheduled to preach in July. Latham was going to preach for the month. Uh, but things don't always go as you think they're going to go, uh, if you've not noticed that. Uh, sometimes things just change. 
And so at the end of June, I was realizing uh, I was going to need to preach in July. So I'm thinking about praying about what should we talk about in July. And I was asking God for a sign. Well, God gave me not a sign, but a lot of signs. They were all in the parking lot. Uh, You pass them all the time. When you pull in, on one side there's a map of the campus. But as you leave, you leave with this message to be the church. Now, uh, just almost five years ago when we put those signs up, uh, we did a sermon series with that very name, Be the Church. If you were here, you might remember that. Uh, But just rest assured, and I think I said this last week, these are not reruns of sermons from five years ago. All right, the theme is the same, but the sermons are new. So don't tune out yet, at least. Uh, but we're, So we're talking about what does it mean to be the church. And this morning, you heard this passage from Galatians. Now, I happen to know that in the church, there was a Bible study studying the book of Galatians not too long ago. I don't know how many Bible studies meet a week on campus, but there's occasions when I'm walking by a room And I'll see a group of people, obviously, in Bible study. So I'll just walk in and just say hello. Uh, And that was my intent one night. I didn't know what they were talking about. I didn't know they were studying Galatians. I didn't know they were looking at almost this exact passage that you heard me read. But that's where they were. Where Paul spends a lot of time talking about circumcision. Now, we don't spend much time talking about circumcision today. Right? You have probably never sat down at a family dinner and had somebody say, Hey, why don't we talk about circumcision over the meatloaf? Right? Not the kind of thing that happens now. But Paul talked about it a decent amount. Paul, obviously from a Jewish background, uh, it was a very important Jewish ritual. Going back all the way to the book of Genesis. Uh, one of those things by which they identified themselves as a people. To the point where... Sometimes Jews would call themselves the circumcised or the circumcision, a way of identifying themselves. And everybody else, all these Gentiles, all these non-Jews, were the uncircumcised. You heard both of those words in the scripture. Circumcised, uncircumcised, circumcision, uncircumcision. I did not know on this Wednesday night that that's where the Bible study was. I was just trying to be friendly. So I walk in and just say, hey, good evening, guys. How's everything going? And they said, we're so glad you're here. We need your help. Well, you know, that kind of boasts the ego, right? I'm happy to help. How can I help? Well, we're studying Galatians. You know Galatians? Oh, yeah, I love Galatians. Then they hit to the heart of the matter. Well, we're here where Paul talks about the circumcised and the uncircumcised, and that's about when I knew I was going down a road I probably should have avoided. We're talking about the circumcised and the uncircumcised, And our question is, who checked? (laughs) That's the kind of deep theological questions I get in this place. (laughs) So I gave it a beat and I said, I'm pretty sure they were on the honor system. All right. And so they chuckled and I chuckled and I walked away. And it really should have been over at that moment, but it wasn't. Because as I'm walking across the parking lot, I see, I pass somebody carrying a Bible. This fellow obviously headed to Bible study. So I said, you headed into Bible study? He said, yeah, I'm just running a few minutes late. And I had this idea that I thought was pretty funny. I, I said, D- would you do me a favor? He said, sure, what you need? I said, when you walk in, walk in and tell them, David says, I'm the man for the job. <laughs> he kind of cocked his head. He said, do what? So I repeated myself. He said, Okay, so sure enough, I found out later, he did walk into Bible study, opens the door and says, David says, I'm the man for the job. He said it took about five minutes for them to calm down enough to explain to them to him why they thought that was so funny. Uh, and they'll say, I thought that was amusing. And when I heard the whole story, when I heard he actually followed through with it, and I went home and I told Susan the story because I thought it was funny. And she says what she says to me often, which is, it's amazing anybody ever comes back to church with you. We are, in, we are, like them, we are in Galatians. So let's back up just a minute to the very beginning of the letter. Paul starts the letter with these words. Paul, an apostle, to the churches of Galatia. 
Not church. Church is. Galatia was not a city like so many of the places that he, to which Paul wrote. Philippi, uh, Rome, Corinth, all cities. Galatia was a region uh, made up of a lot of towns, villages. It's located in modern-day Turkey. A couple of years ago when I was in Turkey, I had the chance to visit part of Galatia. It's an amazing place. So Paul writes to all these churches, and believe it or not, that you had churches that had conflicts within. I know that's hard for us to imagine that a church would ever have infighting, right? Uh, We can't imagine such a thing. But they actually had some internal strife going on. And it was basically between a couple of different groups. You had those who came from Jewish backgrounds. Paul was one. uh, But these folks who came from Jewish backgrounds, you have to understand, they had spent their lives trying to keep the law. And one of their metaphors for the law actually was circumcision. They spent their life trying to keep the law. They spent their life anticipating the coming of the Messiah, and not just their lives, but their parents' lives and grandparents and great, great, great back hundreds, a couple of thousands of years trying to keep the law, anticipating the Messiah. Well, now here they are, decades after Jesus was crucified and resurrected, and they believe Jesus was the Messiah. So they are now following Jesus the Messiah, but you still have all of that uh, generations of history. So there's still a part of them that had a hard time letting go of the law. We are still, you still have to be a Jew to really appreciate Jesus as Messiah. So these people that were not from Jewish backgrounds, Gentiles, coming into the church saying, we have faith in Jesus, they're going, well, that's great, but that's not enough. You need to first be Jewish before you can then become a follower of Jesus. First be circumcised. Keep the law. And Paul is trying to help them understand Jesus came not to abolish the law, but Jesus fulfilled the law. So you don't have to worry about fulfilling the law. You have to, by faith, live in his grace. And so he writes some pretty stern words. Here again, verse 4. You are trying to be justified by law. You who are trying to be justified by law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. If you keep going down this road, you've been alienated from Christ. I told you it was stern. Go back a couple of verses. Mark my words, he says. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. They've been trying to say, well, you've got to be like us. And Paul's like, oh, no, 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 no. No, no, they don't. They can simply come in by faith. So you can imagine those who came from a strong Jewish background, the circumcised, are going, really? Really? But you can also imagine the other group, who they said, we told you so, we win the argument. Ah, we knew it. We knew it. We were right, you were wrong. We knew it. Paul's not done. Verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. Yeah, yes, they're missing the mark. But if you're excited that you won this argument, what you need to understand is you shouldn't be having the argument. If you're spending all your time arguing about this, you're worried about the wrong thing. So not only, this gets even more shocking the deeper into this we get, Not only was there a church where there was infighting, which I know we've never, ever seen before, right? But what they were fighting over, Paul says, was not all that important. Surely we've never seen Christians, sisters and brothers, get all worked up over things that really didn't matter. When I was in grad school, I was walking across campus with a buddy of mine, and we saw a sign for this club that was forming. Uh... There was uh, an evangelical club, they called it. Now, we read that. Our understanding of what is an evangelical is somebody who wants to tell other people about Jesus, somebody passionate about sharing the gospel of Jesus. We saw that, and we said, well, we're evangelicals. We fit in this camp. Let's go. So we go to the first meeting, the first meeting of people passionate about sharing the gospel of Jesus. They met for an hour. You want to know the conversation for the hour? What are we going to call ourselves? People had this idea, that idea. 
got a little tense, not too bad, trying to decide what is going to be the name of the group. Well, if we say this, you kind of imply that. If you say that, you kind of imply this. And we're looking at each other going, really? I mean, an hour? But, you know, it's only the first meeting. That's okay. Let's give it another try. So we went back the next week. Second meeting, people passionate about sharing the gospel of Jesus. The second meeting, the agenda was, we need to talk about officers. Officers, do we need officers? Well, that's what we need to decide. Do we need officers? Do we need a president? If we have one, do we have to call them a president? Can we call them a chair? Well, why would you want to call them a chair? Why can't we call them a president? Well, I want to call it a chair. And if we have a chair, can we have a vice chair? Do we need a treasurer? Are we going to collect money? Is this going to cost us? So we spent an hour talking about the need for officers and what those officers might look like and when they might be elected and what might the criteria be. And we're sitting there going, okay, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll give it another shot. Again, you, you know, some decisions have to be made. That's fine. So week three, third week, third meeting, people passionate about sharing the gospel of Jesus. They were no longer interested in officers. They had their eyes on bigger things. We need to start running folks for student government. We need to get people involved in student government. So we spent an hour listening to tactical plans about running people for student government, still trying to figure out why we were there. But we decided we'd give it one more shot. Fourth week, fourth meeting, people passionate about sharing the gospel of Jesus. Now we were getting down to business. Because in the fourth meeting, do you know what we talked about? We talked about how we needed to talk about sharing the gospel. We weren't actually doing it. We weren't even talking about it. But we were talking about how in the future we were going to talk about sharing the gospel. And at the end of the meeting, they said, any questions? And my buddy finally raised his hand and spoke the first words either of us has said after four weeks. He said, are there ever any plans to leave the room, go out on campus, I don't know, the student center, the dining hall, the quad, anywhere to go out on campus and actually, maybe, possibly, tell somebody about Jesus? And they looked at us like we were fanatics. And we didn't go back. And maybe it was just us. But we walked out of there thinking, are we really spending our time on things that count? Are we really spending our time on things that matter? Paul is writing to the churches in Galatia. He says, man, you've ex- you're work- you got a lot of energy going here. But it has no value. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing, the only thing that counts, he says, is faith expressing itself through love. Faith expressing itself through love. This is actually New International Version. The New American Standard is a tad more concise. I really like it. Faith working through love. Faith working through love. That, Paul says, is what counts. If we want to be the church, we need to invest our time in things that count. So let's talk about it. Faith working through love. Faith. It's one of those words we use a lot. I got faith in this. I got faith in that. A lot of times I think we confuse faith and hope. But faith is actually more than hope. You might have walked in here today saying, I really hope it's a short sermon. But sometimes your hopes are disappointed. I might have walked in here this morning hoping for a $100,000 offering, but often my hopes are disappointed. Faith is more than that. Hebrews chapter 11 says faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Being sure of what we hope for. Not random, empty hope, but hope that has surety, certainty. Believing in something even before you can see it, you know it is true. And you know it's reality. And it's not just uh, theoretical. It's active. If you keep reading Hebrews 11, it tells you all the things done by faith. There's a who's who list of people in the Old Testament. By faith, Noah did this. By faith, Abraham did this. By faith, Moses did that. On and on about things done by faith. Because faith is to be active. Paul says what counts is that faith working through faith. Love. Love's another one of those words we toss around a lot. And we talk about loving toothpaste or loving a TV show or loving a car. But Paul says, no, it's a little more than that. Again, he defines it in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Right? He tells you what it's not, but also what it is. He says, love is patient. 
Love is kind. And then a laundry list of things that love is not. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil. So if you see any of those things happening, you know it's not truly love. But then what is love? What does it do? It rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. That's the kind of love Paul is talking about when he says faith working through love. It's the kind of love that Jesus was talking about, the same Greek word agape. Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Faith in the love, faith working through the love that flows from the Lord through us. Paul said, that's what counts. There were times in the churches in Galatia, and there are times in churches in West Cobb, times in Paul's day and times when ours, when sisters and brothers in Christ invest an awful lot of energy in things that don't really matter and don't really count. Paul says the only thing, the only thing that counts is faith working through love. Now, hearing that, uh, our faith uh, taking a stand for our faith, that counts. Uh, all kinds of ways we do that. That counts. Faith working through love. What does it look like? Uh, Jack and Jane Johnston are members of our church, been here, been around a long time, and recently Jack's health has not been great. Uh, he's had a lot of mobility issues. I was talking to Jane, I forgot how long ago, asking how he was doing, and she said it's getting harder for him to walk down the steps from the house into the garage. It just, it's getting harder. And I said, well, you know, our church has built a ramp or two in our day. If you think that that might be helpful, let me know. And she said, well, we're not there. We're not there. I said, okay. But just keep that in the back of your mind. So she calls me a while back. And we're shooting the breeze. I was asking about her and about Jack. And she said, so you mentioned a ramp. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, is that really something the church could do? I said, absolutely. Are you ready? And she said, I think we need it. I think we need it. So I picked up the phone and I called the president of our Methodist men. I said, Jack and Jane need a ramp uh, into their garage. He said, done. And it was done. A group went out, built the ramp. Uh, They got it done. Jane called me uh, and she said, they just finished the ramp. Thank you so much. I said, I worked really hard on that. I made a phone call. They did, of course, give me permission to tell you this story. But I talked to her as recently as yesterday. Yesterday afternoon, I was talking to her. I said, how's Jack? And she said, so Jack is now on a rollator. And if you're not familiar with a rollator, it's kind of like a walker with handbrakes, but there's also a seat in it. So that's what Jack walks around with this rollator. And she said, he can go to the mailbox by himself, get the mail, and come back. Now, that may not seem like a big deal to you. But if you've not been able to do it, It becomes a big deal. A ramp may not seem like a lot to you until you need it. And then it's a big deal. They did that for Jack. Not the first one that has been done for a member here at Due West by our folks. Probably, I'm sure, won't be the last. But don't hear that this is just something we do for one another. I don't know how many times that has been done. We get phone calls from the community. People that just hear that we have done that, that have no ties to the church, but say, we just desperately need this. Is there any way your church could come and help? And our church can, and our church does. That's faith working through love. That's one little example. Ramps are one little example of faith working through love. Being the hands and feet of Jesus. Taking the faith that we have in him. Living in his grace by faith. And letting his love flow through us to the world around us. Faith working through love. Now, I've got some other examples uh, that I'm gonna, I want to give you. But then, this is a congregational participation sermon. All right, so you have a part in this. I'll mention a few, then I'm going to ask you all 
And you all get to call out areas where you have seen in our church family people's faith working through love. Are you with me? I'm going to ask, and then you get a chance to do that. Now, let me remind you, we are live streaming this. So, if I ask that, and y'all sit there quietly and stare at me, we just all look bad. Do you, do you want to look bad? Okay, about 40% of you do not want to look bad. I guess the rest of you do. God bless you. I'm praying for you. And I'm going to ask again. Do you want to look bad? All right, so when I ask, be ready. When you see somebody spend their time in a week preparing and then coming in on Sunday morning to teach a Sunday school class, that's faith working through love. When you see people coming into Building C on Tuesdays and packing lunches for must summer lunch ministry for children that otherwise wouldn't eat, that's faith working through love. When you see people come in on Thursdays and take those very same lunches and go deliver them, that's faith working through love. When you see our Stitching Sallies, they're a quilting group, they meet every week. When you walk by and see them making quilts to give away to people in love that are going through a hard time, that's faith working through love. When you see our congregational care ministers take communion to shut-ins or just go to hospitals or just go and visit shut-ins or all the things that they do uh, and with volunteer hours, that's faith working through love. You see how this is going? Okay, somebody give me another example. When, when our group goes to Murphy Harps, and Murphy Harps Residential Treatment Center, if you don't know, for Georgia's most severely neglected and abused children, and we have a long history of going up and doing work there at Murphy Harps. That's a great example. That's faith working through love. What else? Waymakers, which is celebrating, is, I have not seen Carrie this morning, next, son, next Saturday, Waymaker celebrates their first anniversary. There are living babies born uh, because of the ministry of Waymakers, because of what things that uh, you guys are doing. Uh, first anniversary is next week. It's an incredible ministry. Uh, yeah, that is certainly faith working through love. Yeah, uh, the ministry that we do, working with Seven Bridges, going down, uh, being in ministry to folks in the homeless in Atlanta, that's faith working through love. Making sleeping mats out of plastic bags for the homeless. That's right. Faith working through love. Mayor Margaret. Working in the pantry. That's right. Making sure that people who are hungry have food. Faith working through love. Christ, uh, okay. Christmas boxes. Absolutely. Every year we do the Christmas boxes, the angel tree, so that children who might otherwise get nothing for Christmas it can enjoy Christmas presents. That's faith working through love. Was that Tom? Oh, okay. There you go. It is still faith working through love. Do what? Yeah, dementia ministry. Uh, one of the most amazing things goes on uh, here. That's faith working through love. Helping families. Uh, the literal title is loving through dementia. Uh, helping families uh, that are battle that have a loved one with dementia. Yeah, youth ministry. Great example. They just got back from Carter a month ago. Faith working through love. So you see, you see how this goes. Everywhere you look around. That's what, that's what it means to be the church. You can spend a lot of time on things that don't count, but we only get so much time. Paul says the only thing that counts is faith working through love. Now, I don't know where you were when you came into the uh, place this morning. Uh, maybe you had a strong faith, but maybe you were kind of on the fence. Maybe this whole thing, the faith in general, is new to you. Uh, but maybe that's the step you want to take to say, I want to know more about what does it mean to follow Jesus. And to let his love flow through me. If that's the case, I'd love to talk to you. Reach out to me. Let's talk. Let's pray. Maybe you came in and you said, well, you know, I've been coming for a long time. And yes, I have faith. But it really has not been all that active. I wouldn't make 11th chapter of Hebrews with the things I've done by faith. But I'm ready to do more. I'm ready to do more. Reach out to me. We will find a place for you to serve. Maybe you came in this morning and said, I have, I have found my place in due west and I want to join the church. This is the day. If that's the case, you're invited to come in a moment as we sing our closing hymn. Uh, and you can join our church family. Wherever you are, though, wherever you are, what is that next step for you? As we ask the Lord to grow the, our faith within us and let his love flow through us so that we can do things that count. What is it that you need to do? Let's pray. Gracious God, do. Grow our faith. Uh, give us faith the size of a mustard seed because you say it can move mountains. But let it not stay that size, Lord, let it grow. 
Let it continue to grow. Let it continue to increase. We ask as the disciples ask. Increase our faith. And Lord, with that faith, let your love flow in us, through us, to the world around us. So that as our faith in you is an expression of the love that you pour through us, we will truly be the church you are calling us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, as, as I said, as we stand and sing How Great Thou Art, if there's something on your heart about what you would like to pray, you're invited to come. Or if you'd like to come and join our church family, you're invited to come down as we stand together and sing How Great Thou Art.
Thank you. Ha, have a seat. Uh, this, morning is, this morning it's great to have Barry and Judy Davis come and Terry Smith to come to join our church family. So I ask you guys, do you publicly profess your faith in Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And will you be loyal to Christ through this congregation and uphold it by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? All right. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I commend to your love and care of these folks who we this day receive into the membership of this congregation. Do all in your power to increase their, their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. Would you respond? We rejoice to recognize you as members of Christ's Holy Church and bid you welcome to this congregation of the United Methodist Church. With you, we renew our vows to uphold it by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. With God's help, we will so order our lives after the example of Christ that surrounded by love, that vast love, you may be established in the faith and confirm and strengthen in the way that leads to life eternal. Would you welcome the Davises and Terry into our church family? Uh, we're glad to have them all. As Susan came down to have Terry, you can say Terry's like part of our family. So it's exciting for us. I'm going to ask you guys, if you would, to walk to the back. And I'll join you there in just a minute. So uh, this would be the time. Yes? Yeah. Um, so if you'll stand, follow the benediction, turn, greet your neighbor, tell them God bless them. Tell them you enjoyed worshiping the Lord with them today. And as you leave, welcome to Davis's and Terry into our church family. If you don't know them, introduce yourself. Uh, Terry is already on our media team. He's back there training today, actually. But uh, introduce yourself. Let them know who you are. Will you do that? All right. Gracious God, send us forth with our faith increased that it might be working through love in all that we say and all that we do. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Jesus' name we worship. In Jesus' name we go forth. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.